Good day, everybody. I'm Kevin Hogan, author of The Psychology of Persuasion, 21 other books that have been translated into 41 languages all around the world. Welcome, the body language and nonverbal communication of selling. We begin with the messages that you can send, and then we talk a little bit about the way to interpret the messages you're receiving from the people that you're involved in the sales process with. The very first thing that you can do to send a good message when you're in front of another person is to utilize a box. I came across the phrase the Clinton box as honor of President Clinton, who after he had gotten in a little bit of trouble back in the 90s, we made a little rule that people should always talk and keep their hands in a certain boxed area when they're in the selling process. And that box goes from here, which is neck height, all the way over to shoulder width, down here to waist high. And the rule is very simple. The first thing is, is we don't ever touch anything above the neck. That means we don't scratch an itch, we don't play with our hair, we don't touch our nose, we don't touch the ear, we don't fix everything here and make it all look just so. You and I are communicating with somebody in a sales process. Everybody has beliefs, feelings, emotions around how other people looked and react, look and react in any given situation. So for example, if I touch my nose, a lot of people believe that that means the person is lying. A lot of times people believe that if you touch the ear that the person is lying. So we don't ever do those things. We make sure that's not going to happen. What it really means is the person is more self-aware of how they feel on their face than they are aware of the individual that's sitting right in front of them. That's what it really means. It does indicate some anxiety, which again is all about not being fully involved and invested in you, but being more aware of myself. Therefore, we don't ever touch anything above the neck because it can only send a bad message. We don't touch anything below the waist, which means we don't stick our hands in our pockets. We don't put them in our back pockets. We don't touch anything. We don't touch our knees or our feet. We don't tie our shoes. We have to shake hands with the shoes that we, with the hands that, that have been just tying shoes and picking things up and all that. So we just don't touch anything over here. As far as putting your hands to the right and the left, the rule is more like this. We don't do this, okay, or this. What we do is we turn our trunk and we always keep everything in front of our trunk, okay? So just like this, our torso. And so we can talk like this and we can talk like this. This is in the sales process, face-to-face, one-on-one. We don't talk about things out here. We don't talk about things over here or here. We don't wave our hands around like this. These are all credibility-reducing gestures. They don't do us any good. Now, there are times when you're on a stage, and if you're on a stage or at the front of the room, there's times when, you know, being the third base coach could come in handy. Okay, that's fine. But when you're face to face with the person, you want to stay in the box to improve the probability that you're going to send good, credible messages to the other person. That's where we begin. Then we want to think about our feet and our legs. Now, in order to send a really good message to other people, it's best that you keep your feet pointed toward the person that you're communicating with. They will then know consciously and non-consciously, and it's more important non-consciously, that they feel comfortable that you do indeed want to be with them, that you don't need to be with somebody else over there. So my feet are pointed, well, hang on, now they're pointed toward you. There was a little part of me that wanted to go that way, see? But now it's pointed towards you, and now I'm comfortable being here with you. Lower body, same thing. If I were to cross my feet and put one leg over the other or one foot over the other, I still want them pointed toward you. And I'll always make sure that's the case if you and I are in a communication and my job is to see if I can get you or cause you to purchase and something from me or do business with me in some way. Now, let's go up to the top of the body, the face. The face is the expression point. Granted, we do express with all the rest of our body too, but the face is pretty huge. When it comes to total sum value in a face-to-face -face interaction, this is where the game is really played. So the biggest mistake that people made is sending messages that are false, that are not true. And so they smile, they say, hey, it's really good to see you today, how are you? And the thing is, is the plastic smile where it works for the fourth grade child and you appreciate their effort, it doesn't work when you're an adult and we see the person is insincere and not authentic. 
Therefore, you want to make sure that you're communicating exactly what you feel in that moment. And you want to allow yourself to recalibrate to the setting to get out of any feelings that you were in before. And so now here you are, and now we have the new situation, you and I face to face, and now when we say something and it's actually amusing or interesting, then I might actually, and so might you, break a smile. And you might actually start to have a little bit better feel about something. Hey, maybe you show me a picture of your kids and I look at a picture of your, your kids, it's like, hey, they're pretty cute compares favorably to my own. And you pull out your own photos and there you is, like there you are, and you let the people see your photos. It's pretty hard not to look at those photos and smile. And that's what you want to do. You always want to be genuine and authentic. That's how you're going to connect with most people. So smiling is important and a genuine warm smile has a lot of value. But when it's there, and when it's there for a long, long time, and when it just, this has only been 10 seconds, this has only been 12, 13. It's too much. It's overwhelming. It says it's not real and it's it's baloney. And so you don't want to ever do that to send the wrong message. Now, what about your posture and where you're going to interact with people in the rest of your body, like the general picture? Are you going to have a closed stance? Like are you going to be standing like this with somebody or are you going to be like this? Okay, or are you going to be like this? Now, we'll talk about how to read these cues from other people in a minute, but just from sending out cues from this vantage point of sending you a cue, what does this say to you? Right, it means I'm sort of closed off, it might mean I'm a little antagonistic, it might mean I'm even hostile or, or or unhappy with you about something. Of course, none of these things is true, but that's what happens when you're sending messages. People interpret them. So you need to send messages in the way that people are going to interpret them in a positive way while remaining genuine. Therefore, we don't do this. What we do is we use our hands here and we keep space here between you and me. We never keep too much connection with our hands and for too long, like this. We don't create fences between you and I. You can for a minute, you can't, well, 30 seconds, you can, but you don't want to go beyond that because it becomes a barrier. Barriers mean you're not vulnerable. Vulnerable means you're inauthentic. Inauthentic means the person is going to say no when you ask them. So therefore, you keep your hands like this and you allow free reign into you. Here's your body, the person, you, have full access to everything. I am totally vulnerable, I am totally authentic, and I am totally at your command. That sets you at ease, reduces reactance, reactance being the resistance that comes about influence itself. Reactance is the influence repulsion unit, okay? Whereas resistance says, there's a message that I just gave you, had nothing to do with influence, but you disagreed or you did not like the message or something about it. It was taking away choices. We don't want to do anything that's going to raise reactance or raise resistance. We want to do everything that we do reduces reactance and reduces resistance. Now notice that I kind of go light there with the hands, right? So what if I did this and this as opposed to like this and like this? See, it's a lot harder to like that person when they do that, right? And so you always want to have your gestures be soft if your goal is to create rapport or to continue a positive experience. If you want people to not like you, you can be Mr. Karate Man and go ahead and have real tight gestures like this, okay? But those kind of gestures don't induce the continuation of good rapport. You want to keep your body posture open. You want to send that message of being available to the person, of, of being liked by that person. This means that you're not under threat, even though you might feel threatened, but you're not under threat in their mind because this is your posture, okay? If you're gonna be side to side in some way, you want to do the same thing and always keep your torso facing to them, all right? Now, there's messages that are sent by leaning so you might, for example, there's a few ways you can lean, and then there's a few different messages attached to each of them. First, there is this message where you could be like this. Now this, at the right time and at the right moment, in certain communications can be really a good thing. But in the sales process, where I'm meeting you for the first time, this is too casual, it's too loose, it's too I'm not in control, and I don't care, all right? So 
how could you make yourself more comfortable, rather charming, rather endearing, still sort of have that lean quality which can be really nice without immediately leaning into the person like that? You can actually do this. Now watch what happens with the head. I can be sitting here and talking to you, and then all of a sudden, I can kind of do this. Now there's option A. Now I'm going to have you compare. So if we're here, and that's option B, how does that feel? All right. So most people will tell you that this is pretty comfortable to them. You can only do this for a couple of seconds and it sends a message that you sort of like the person, that you're endeared to them, and you sort of correct it pretty quickly and you bring it back. But it's a very charming thing to do. It's just sort of lean and tilt your head a little off to your right. That's read by most people in a very positive fashion, if it's just for a couple of seconds. However, if it goes for more than a couple of seconds, let's try that. So that would be like this. So like if I'm talking to you like this, and I continue on, and I continue on, would you like to buy the product and service now? Would you like to do business with my company? No. All right, you wonder what's wrong. So it really, you don't want to do a continuation of an extended lean to the left or the right. What about forward and back? When you first sit down, you want to sort of have that military posture, that appropriate welcome to the scenario posture, which is sort of like this. And so we're seated across from each other, and I'm comfortable, but I'm straight up and down, basically. All right? And however you are is the direction that I'm going to be moving to. So if you're sort of tilted a little bit forward, eventually, in a few seconds here, I will do the same thing. I will lean into you. But I won't until I'm quite sure that, I'm, that you're comfortable with being in my space. So as you lean forward, I'll give it 15, 20 seconds, and then I will also lean a little bit over my meal, a glass of wine, a glass of water, whatever is here. And so then I'll get more comfortable and I'll bend a little towards you. And the reason we wait is because we don't want the person, that person to become uncomfortable. As soon as they're uncomfortable, they're going to want to leave. And you'll be able to tell they want to leave by their feet. Their feet are always the first giveaway that things are not going well. So what happens? When the feet are pointed over there toward the door or toward another person, it means that that's where the person would prefer being right now. They feel more secure leaving the room or talking to that other person than they do to you. So what do you do when you notice this? Okay, And granted, this is a reading cue, but that's okay. We'll go here for a second. We'll just skip this one later on. When you see somebody's feet pointed away from you, you need to get them interactive with you right now. This, happened, this kind of a problem happens a lot when people do things like PowerPoint presentations seated down. I'll talk about that a little bit later on too. But basically it's a disaster waiting to happen. When people's feet start to move, when their trunk starts to orient toward that way over there, towards their employees, towards somebody else in the staff, towards the door, you need to get them interactive with you and you need to put that thing that you need them to look at the opposite direction that their feet are pointed for, from so that they will come back to you. Okay, and now you get them involved with this piece of paper, with this document, with this item, with this thing, you give them a gift, something like that. So leaning can be really important, and it is very important. And you can send the right message by waiting to lean into the conversation until they have set the tone and come forward into you. Once the person's come a little into you, they are telling you that they are this comfortable with you. If they're doing one of these things, and they're coming over the table and they're really into you, great. They want to share intimate information, secret information, confidential information, don't want anybody else to see it. That's wonderful. You can do the same thing. You've now been invited into their space. Go ahead and do it. Until then, do not. Next up, touching. In non-sales situations, in your office, in anybody's office, you don't want to touch anybody. Just keep it simple. This isn't the 1970s. And when 1982, 384 hit and everything changed out there in the world, you changed too or you didn't make a living anymore. You have to be careful about touch and yet touch is the most important of all of the things that we can do. Touch is critical. So when you shake a person's hand, you want to shake the person's hand and you kind of do, hey, nice to meet you. Or that's kind of like one, two, three, right? Which works. That's good. The other one is just, hi, Kevin Hogan, nice to meet you. Boom, just like that. Just like what I did. Hi, Kevin Hogan, nice to meet you. 
boom, and it's just there. It's very firm, very solid. And if it's a woman I'm shaking hands with, or a man with a, perhaps a, loose, a looser grip, which does happen a remarkable amount of time, very, very um, disquieting sometimes. But when that happens, let's just say that this is their hand and they're not going to give a good grip, I still make it a very strong grip, but I don't tighten it around. They can, they can easily escape, but they see a very strong, firm, confident shake from me. Whether they reciprocate or not is their own business. I'm there with an iron vise, and then it's warm and it's solid, and if they were to want to escape, they can. I'm not crushing fingers. I'm not doing anything that's going to hurt their hand. It's strong, and it's always strong around a woman's hand as well. Same thing, same exact thing. Women are basically taught to shake hands in a very soft way like this. Now, a lot of women have sort of evolved or devolved. I'm not sure what the right term is, but they've sort of become more like men and have a firmer handshake in business quite often, but not always. Quite often, it's this very soft, delicate shake. And once again, you provide the strength and, the, and, and the, you, you, you show your power, not by squeezing her knuckles together, but simply making it comfortable for her to have that, but very secure within you. The non-conscious um, signals that go back and forth in a handshake are very, very powerful. So don't try to crush somebody's hand. Just be there, be strong, be firm, and it shows that you have confidence in yourself without trying to overwhelm or overpower somebody else. What you don't want to do is this. Hey, nice to meet you. So you're shaking their hand and then you have the, your other hand on the back of their elbow. Not good. You need too much control. It's not genuine. It's not authentic. It's not real. Don't do it. All right. Next up, so touch. What else can we do with touch? Here we've got this person across from us. If I'm seated across from a guy, what are the chances that I'm going to touch this person? Pretty good. If, if I'm sitting down and we're telling a story and say that he's telling me a story about a fishing trip and he says, you know, oh yeah, and I told the wife that I was going to be home on time, but I was late, but I actually was bringing her home something. I might just reach across and just give him one on the shoulder, like right there, you know, like real easy. Just a, just a gentle touch. And that's it. Just like a whatever, right? Like that. And that can work pretty well. It shows you're kind of comfortable. It can be read a lot of wrong ways. But if you don't touch people at all, you're sort of seen as cold. So you're better off having even an accidental touch. So if you're sitting seated at dinner and you have somebody of the opposite sex, but you don't want to be flirtatious, but at the same time you want to show a connection and the person says something that's amusing or funny or that that you agree with, you can always, here's their hand and this is mine, I'll say, you know what, that's exactly right. That is exactly right. That's a very subtle way of saying that you have comfort with this person. You have the ability to communicate with them in a way that shows that you're powerful and yet respectful of them and that you're not trying to overwhelm them in any way whatsoever. Touch is really important. Again, at the office with employees, with people that are superior or subordinate or equal, never touch anybody. The world is that place right now. Next up, we have eye contact. Eye contact is massively important. So what is the real true story about eye contact? Well, the thing is, it's culturally dependent. For example, African Americans like to have a lot of eye contact on average. So. And women who are African-American, African-American women, they like to have almost 100% eye contact all of the time. Men that are African-American like to have eye contact too, but not as much as African-American women. And on the other side of the spectrum, we have Asians. Asians generally have, now, there is a difference between Asian and Asian-American. Asians from Malaysia and Vietnam and Thailand and China and Japan, in general, like to have less eye contact, it's more appropriate to come up and down as you communicate and as you listen as well. That's the key point. All right. Where are we at in Caucasian America right here? That's this guy right here. Well, sort of. All right. So where are you here? Well, here it's about 70% eye contact is right. Well, how do you do 70% eye contact? You want to send the right message. So what are you going to do? What you're going to do is when you're talking, when I'm listening to you and you're speaking, I'm going to be paying attention to your eyes almost 100% of the time, only occasionally breaking down. We'll call it 95%. When I'm speaking, when I have a message to share with you, I'm going to give you about 50 to 55% eye contact. So I'm going to be here and then I'm going to break down and then I'm going to come back up and I'm going to break down again and I'll be talking over here a little bit and then I'll come back up like this. 
about 55%. So our total average eye contact between you and I, depending on whether you're African American, Caucasian, or Asian, and there's also differences for Native America beyond the scope of this video, but we'll, we'll determine that de depending upon the culture that you're from and that I'm from, and we'll try to interact those two components into one logical strategy. Now, what about eye color? The color of our eyes is really important. People are used to looking at blue people, blue-eyed people, blue people, at blue-eyed blue people for a longer period of time than they are for brown-eyed people. So if, some, if, if you are looking at a blue-eyed client, they have nice blue eyes, they anticipate not, they don't think about it, it's just non-conscious. They assume that you're going to look at them a lot more than if they have brown eyes or really dark eyes or green eyes. Meanwhile, if the person has brown eyes, they anticipate non-consciously that you'll be looking at them less than somebody that had blue eyes. So you'll have less eye contact with somebody with brown eyes and more with somebody with blue. Another great signal that you can send is a head nod. It can also be a complete disaster. So for example, say that I'm sitting here talking with you and say that I'm sharing something with you and all of a sudden, I want to send you the signal that, like, I'd like you to agree with this. Well, there's a couple ways you can do this wrong, and there's a couple ways you can do it right. So say that I want you to agree with it, whatever I'm going to share with you. One strategy I could use that's going to fail is I could start to head nod for you and create the viral effect. And you probably will nod right now. But nodding does not mean that you agree. Nodding means that you will now take whatever's in your brain right now, whatever's in your mind computing and calculating, and you will now agree, if you will, with what's there. It will be confirmed. So if you were thinking, oh, you know what, I think I will bring Kevin Hogan to speak at our event, great, perfect, I, my little gamble paid off. But if you were thinking, geez, I don't know if I should bring her in or not, I don't know if that would be a great idea, I've thought about it, and all of a sudden she starts nodding at you up and down, like, hey, don't you think that's a good idea if I came up? And then she says, you know, would you like me to be there? And all of a sudden, even though you're nodding inside, you're nodding to the thought, I don't think I like her that much. You know, I don't think we're going to do that. So that's how that can work. So you can send the wrong message or you can send the right message. The best thing is to wait for that person to nod at an undeniable fact. So you say something that's an undeniable truth and then they nod and then you do as well. That sends the message that you're in sync, you're in rapport, you have agreement, now you've utilized a really important tool in a very cool way. Now, those are a few straight body language tips. What about some nonverbal communication tips in getting the right message sent from me to you? How do I do that? Well, the first thing is, is I can choose the right chair to sit in, say we're at a restaurant. So, for example, we're at the restaurant and I can say, huh, I arrive 15 minutes early. I always do, right? Never. What does time tell you? Time, time tells you if, if you're 15 minutes late, two minutes late, the other person's not important. You would never be late, ever, for anything, ever, because it means you're not important. Something else was more important than you. You'd never do that. So I always arrive first. I always find myself seated, and I seat myself facing the entire restaurant. I'm in the back, and the only thing that's visible behind me is the wall. There's nothing else. There are no bus boys, there's no waitresses, there's no hosts, there's no anything. It's just me, the person who's going to be seated right here in a few minutes, and the wall, and that's it. Therefore, the only thing the person can see and communicate with is me. I can't lose the sale because of some goofball coming by and dropping dishes or screwing up. Okay. I now have full view of the entire restaurant. I see when the waiter's coming. I see when the host is coming. I see all of that. The person that's sitting with me sees nothing except for me. That means I have to be good the whole time. And that's how you want to communicate. You always want the responsibility to be on you because the other person will not have or accept that responsibility. People don't, okay? All right, so that's one thing. The next thing that you can do with seat seating is a pretty cool strategy, which is based on hemispherics in the brain. This is pretty awesome. I discovered this in 1998 at the University of St. Thomas doing some experimentation there. And what we found out was is that if I was seated off to 
the person's right that I was communicating with. They liked me more, they found me more believable, and they found me more interesting and attractive instead of the person who was over here and I was on their left when it was the opposite. There were exceptions when the person was left-handed, but with all right-handed people, when you are off to their right, you will discover that they find that you are more interesting, more attractive, more believable. Why? You've, activa you've activated their left brain because they're looking off to the right, this is to the right, and I've activated the left brain. The left brain is where Broca's center is. Broca's center is the speech function, it's also the logic area. And of course, these are big overwhelming generalizations, it's not like we've just shut the right brain down because we're looking off over here. But we've done a pretty good job of shutting the right brain down, which is what you want, why? In the right brain, you have emotions. You have, well, you have emotions on both sides, but you have a much more emotional connection to the past, to, to stimulus response, bad situations that have happened, antagonism, hostility, anger, fear, uh, guilt, contempt, all kinds of emotions, almost all. Every now and then you get joy, but it's not very often. So when you trigger off right brain activity, how does that happen? This is the right brain. It comes from me looking over there. And if I look over there for long, I will start to feel anxiety. Now, I might feel other things as well, but if I look for two minutes off to my left, you can almost be certain the person, or me in this case, will feel anxiety within two minutes. I'll let you demonstrate it with yourself later on. Look off to your left for two minutes, over that way, and you will find that you'll feel anxiety. Look off to the right for two minutes, you'll look and you'll feel comfortable, at ease. Great thing to remember if you get nervous or have a panic attack or you're simply stressed out about something. Looking off to the right, very difficult to be upset about anything. Therefore, you always make sure they're over here and you're over here. What if they're left-handed? We'll talk about that when I come to your company. Complicated. Now, so that's sending great messages. How do I read messages well? How do you know what they're thinking? How do you know what's coming from them? How are you supposed to read that information? Well, let's just look at a few things real quick. The first thing that you can do before you ever meet anybody is to go to their Facebook page, make sure that you've liked the, the person that you're gonna be meeting with, and look at all of their video. Find out how they act around people. Find out how they act around family and friends so you know what is going to happen when they meet with you that's different from how they are with family and friends. And as they start to behave more similarly to what they did with family and friends, then you know you're closer to rapport. That's called calibration. That's hugely important. Now, what happens when the person puts on that plastic smile and they're like this and they're saying, hey, how you doing? My name is Bill Johnson. What's up with you? Hey, Kevin, how's it going? It's really nice to meet you. Well, first of all, we know that the person's being false at this moment, right? So with the false smile, perhaps they're trying, but they're not being genuine. No sale will happen while a person is being disingenuine. They feel like a fraud. They know that they're not really happy. And even though sometimes smiling can bring happy thoughts to the person's brain, it doesn't always. It only does so about 10% more often than if the person is like this. Your job is not to see if you can be happy today. Your job is not to see if you can make them happy, although sometimes that's important. Your job is really to make a sale today. And the way that you do that is by being genuine and authentic with other people. So as they smile, you can give them a little smile back and say, hey, it's nice to meet you. And then you go back to how you really feel inside. Their smile will eventually break down and come down into how they should be communicating with their friends that you noticed on Facebook the other day. Similarly, you'll notice on that those Facebook videos or photos that they were a certain distance from people. And I'm not talking about the pictures that are all on Facebook where you got somebody like this. I'm talking about when they're really interacting with people. You can find out now how close people get when they interact. Do they, are they this far away? Are they this far away? Here's a secret. If people put any part of their body inside of this 18 inches right here they come within here nose any part of their body whatsoever comes inside of here they are very comfortable with you you can read that and guess that and be pretty correct if somebody comes into this space now there's always exceptions sometimes they're incredibly angry one thing you're going to learn over time with body language and nonverbal studies is that people who are angry behave almost identically to people who are happy happy people are impulsive people 
Angry people are impulsive people. Angry and happy people tend to purchase the first options that they're shown. They tend to not want to look at other options. Okay, that's pretty worth knowing, right? So you can usually get a pretty good read. However, people who are fearful, anxious, uncomfortable, contemptuous, hostile, um, frustrated, upset about certain things, but not directly angry, not directly angry, anything but that, that's an emotion, those people tend to buy the second or third choices if they're going to buy something, so you wouldn't show them first. You can only tell that by looking at a person's body language. If the person gets close to you, the probability is quite high that they are going to buy from you, and that's a great thing. Don't ever try to back up and back away from the person. Even if it's uncomfortable, I want you to make sure that you stand your ground and allow that other person to use you as sort of this, this buffer and let them come into your bubble as close as they want or stay back as far as they want. If you're seated across a the table, they'll lean forward and eventually you will too, but you won't until they do. As you look at the, tr the, the trunk of their body, whoo, right here, okay, where is it facing? There you are. Is the trunk facing you, like right there? Great, they like you, all right? Is it facing away like this over here? Well, they might like you, but they're not paying any attention to you. The trunk of the body, and if, especially if it's true with the feet, if the feet have also been, are pointing over here, or the legs are too, you can bet that their, their attention is over there. And when that's the case, you need to get them interactive. Once again, you've gotta get them interactive with something here to bring them back like that, to bring them back into you. When you see people leaning, if you see somebody leaning and talking to you like this or like this, you have just made a sale. The person who's like this is so authentic and so comfortable with you that they're willing to do this. Most people read this as if they don't care. That's just not true at all. They're comfortable with you. If they were uncomfortable, they'd be doing this or they'd be doing this or they'd be doing this, okay? But they're not. They're here and they're comfortable. Now they might be bored, but bored and comfort for most people tends to go hand in hand. That's actually okay. So if you see this, you can read it as a positive buying signal. The body sort of tilted over one way or the other. Same thing. It's a positive signal overall. And this is when your own little head not off to the right like that, remember I showed you that earlier, can be very charming and very nice. And at this point, you can put your hands in your pockets and sort of go, you know, like that and it's very nice. And you also have to return to up and down very quickly, all right? Okay, so your, their feet, again, where their feet are pointing is going to determine where their attention is, where most of their attention is. And remember, people's conscious thoughts and their non-conscious behaviors are two different things. It's very poss possible that a person's non-conscious mind might be over here. You need that non-conscious mind um, to be involved in your process in sort of controlling the emotional uh, content of their non-conscious. That's all for a different day. But you can't let a person's trunk of their body and feet be directed over here while you're over here. When that's the case, you simply be quiet and pause. The person returns to you, and now they're back with you. That's what you need and that's what you want. When people do broad gestures like this, they say, hey Kev, I don't know, whatever, I haven't got a clue, what do I do? Or what should I do? I don't know what to do. These are all buying, these are way past buying signals. These are I'll do anything you want me to do, how much do you want today signals. These signals say I'll do anything when they're coming from that person. The person's completely comfortable. They have no control whatsoever. They're totally impulsive. This is ready, they're ready right now to say yes to anything you want. If the person's here, 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 any of these things, you're good, okay? So broad gestures can be really, really nice especially when they're not illustrating a point. Just random gesturing like this that doesn't mean anything can be really cool and be super impressive. This is when you cut your sales presentation short and you go ahead and allow the person to buy now. If the person is nodding at you like this, you know, that could be a good thing. It could be. If it goes on for more than three or four seconds, it's not a good thing. The person who nods like this, think about it, watch. It's not good, is it? No. A real head nod is, that's a good head nod. One second, boom, and it's done, and the person's with you, that's when they're agreeing with you. That's where you say, so, make sense? 
Yes, good. Okay, sign. There it is. Done. You're over. It's done. It's finished. But when the person's doing this, what they're really thinking is, oh yeah, Mr. Johnson, I don't believe a word you're saying. You know, though, I'm, I'm going to be polite and I'm going to nod here and I'm going to go ahead. But you know what, sir? I think you're just not being truthful with me. And that's what the head nod typically means when it goes for more than two seconds. Finally, if you have to arrive with without having had the opportunity to choose the seat first, for example, say it's their office, okay, so you arrive at their office, where they ask you to sit is going to largely determine whether or not it's going to set the tone for the conversation. And so if the person has you seated, you could say, oh, by the way, can we sit over here? If the person has you off to their left and they are right-handed, that's where you say, by the way, can we sit over at the meeting table over there? I got something I want to show you. You could show them just as easily over the desk, but right now, you, they're over here, you're here, you're both right-handed, this is a bad setup. You just assume take it over here, okay? So you can suggest a different seating option, and you can read that signal. It's not an intentionally bad thing on somebody's part, but a lot of times people have obviously have no idea. The study's not that old that we did. It's only 15 years old. And that kind of material takes time to get into the public. So you absolutely must make sure that the seating is correct when you're communicating with people. Okay, so that's how you send and read some cool signals. Take five sending signals this week, one each day. Test it out, utilize it, evaluate at the end of the day, see how you did. Then next week, do five reading signals, one for each day, see how you do, in reading body language and watch how it changes the number of people that say yes to you. It's going to be pretty cool. For more stuff on body language, and there's a lot more, but for more stuff you can go to kevinhogan.com and I'll see you over there. Otherwise I'll see you at your office. Take care. Thanks a lot. See you next time.